I'm Chris French. I am now Emeritus Professor at uh, the Psychology Department at Goldsmiths, University of London, um, where I was, and I think possibly still am, the head of the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit, which immediately prompts the question, what the hell is anomalistic psychology? Um, and the answer to that is it's, it's really the prime focus of anomalistic psychology is to see if we can come up with and preferably wherever possible test non-paranormal uh, explanations for ostensibly paranormal experiences. But I um, give myself the luxury of basically just looking at the psychology of weird stuff any, any anything that's kind of um you know out of the ordinary i think the psychology behind it is fascinating so yeah that's about it perfect so i'll just add as well that i'm with uh, i'm co-hosting today with matthew from uh, consciousness matters which is his youtube channel uh, you can find that on youtube or yeah i believe you have a website as well don't you matthew uh yeah it's good for email at the moment it only just points at the youtube channel right, right. now but it will do so more later Similar to similar to my very amateur website as well. Okay, so um, I suppose the first area of interest then, Chris, is is um, what kind of got you into this area of interest? Did you begin going into kind of um, scholarly work, I suppose, into academia, looking at this kind of area, or did you shift no. into it over time? Very much the latter. Um, I mean, as a as a as a as a teenager and kind of well into kind of young adulthood, um, I always had a kind of an interest in the paranormal um, and very much from the kind of perspective of someone who believed in it back in back in my youth. Um, but it was very much just uh, not something that was. It, I mean, I did my first degree at Manchester uh, way back in the 1970s. Um, and this kind of topic was hardly touched on at all. I mean. Yeah, really, really, very, very rare. Um, the when I was doing my PhD at Leicester University, which again was on a totally different area, I was looking at hemisphere differences and using EEG and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, someone recommended a particular book to me. Uh, thought I would enjoy it. It was called Parapsychology: Science or Magic, and it was by a Canadian psychologist called James Alcock. Um, and it was the first kind of sceptical approach to these topics that I'd ever come across. And I did enjoy the book. I did find the arguments, by and large, pretty convincing. Uh, and that book kind of basically determined <laughs> where the rest of my life was going to go. Um, even there, I mean, then it started off as a kind of side interest, a hobby. I realised that the kind of there were sceptical books out there. There was, a, a, you know, there, there were also magazines like the Sceptical Inquirer, etc., um and so i kind of immersed myself in the in the world of skepticism which was always all quite exciting at the time i must i must say um and eventually kind of got to meet people like uh, you know james randy and richard wiseman and sue blackmore and all these other people um and that was that was all fun but it wasn't until i, I went to goldsmiths in 1985 and I just did a couple of lectures on this stuff by now from a very sceptical perspective. Um, I and mean, the students liked it, whether they were believers or sceptics, they found it interesting and, you know, wanted, and enjoyed the lectures. Uh, about 10 years later, I realised that I knew enough about this stuff to put on a whole final year option on it. And I was kind of doing the occasional little study here and there. But I mean, I was pretty much actively discouraged from making this my only area of research. Um, it wasn't seen as being very respectable, you know, <laughs> and so I had a kind of um, a parallel stream of more conventional stuff going on as well. But eventually it just got to a point where I realised that this is the stuff that I found the most interesting. It's also it was also what I was known for, you know, in this area, in this very, very specialised area. I could be a big fish in a small pond as opposed to being a small fish in an ocean it, working in more conventional fields. So, um, yeah, that's what I do. I, I wish I'd taken that step earlier, to be quite honest, but no, no matter. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, and so I've gone from being, a, as I say, a believer to being what I would now look back on and think of kind of, uh, in some people's eyes, maybe a kind of more extreme sceptic holding some views that I've since modified. Um, 
you know, I mean, once, once I actually got to meet some parapsychologists, I realised that they weren't all idiots. <laughs> you know, they, they were all very, very intelligent. They understood methodology and statistics and so on and so forth. Um, and so I've kind of come back towards the centre ground, but I'm still, you know, I'm still very much, I would identify as a sceptic. Uh, but one where I feel I've got, you know, I, I, I find it probably sometimes easier to talk to the moderate believers on the other side than the extreme sceptics, I suppose, yes, on my yes. side. Yeah. A good position to be in. I know that myself and Matthew are both more on the proponent side of the, the evidence yeah. that we've looked at. We would suggest, or we, we would kind of interpret it to suggest that it seems more parsimonious to believe that there is more to consciousness um, from an ontological perspective than we currently understand. Um, how, however, <clears throat> as you say, with any field of science, with any phenomena, scepticism is the utmost kind of standard that everyone must have when approaching it. Um, if you approach these sort of things with preset beliefs you know this must be true and i'm only going to look at evidence that supports yeah. it and discount anything that suggests it of course you're not looking at it in a scientific manner no, i'd is... agree I, having, having mm. said that you know th this notion that some people's kind of present themselves as being kind of totally neutral i'm just a neutral assessor of the evidence i mean that's bullshit none of us can do that your, your views might change as indeed mine as i said mine have but now you know sometimes people say to me you know, uh, yeah, there must be a part of you that really wants all that stuff to be true, you know, and uh, I will now give an honest answer and say no, because I've got to the point now where, you know, I, I'm known for being a sceptic, you know, I've got um, a kind of intellectual investment, an emotional investment, and even to some extent a financial investment, you know, I get, I get invited onto these kind of um, tv programs etc because i am an informed skeptic if i suddenly turn around and say yeah you know what i was wrong about all that stuff you know um we are putting kind of psychic claimants to the test i'm not i confess you know i if, when we're looking at the results i'm not there kind of thinking oh I, I do hope they can prove that they really do have telepathy when the results come in and they haven't i'm vindicated i'm not going to have kind of you know egg on my face from by being embarrassed that i would like to think that if i ever found somebody who could do that stuff reliably that i would be big enough to kind of swallow my pride and just kind of say well wow this is amazing let's kind of get to the bottom of what's going on here but uh, you know i'm only human as are other people my the fact that i kind of admit that i have got biases is, is sometimes used against me there's a couple of websites that quote me as you know chris french even admits that he's biased yeah but that's out you've got to have the context that i'm also saying everybody else is as well you know? yeah, i say to the students that's the, that, that's Sorry, the big difference that's the big difference between kind of a, a, a general person of interest with this sort of thing usually the louder more obnoxious people especially on the internet versus those that are approaching it from a scientific point of view we're not saying that to be a, a scientist, to be a, a good researcher of a subject, you should eliminate all biases in your view. That won't happen. That, that can't happen because we're all human. But it's identifying, as you say, and admitting that those biases are there and doing what you can to limit their their um, their effects on the research you take, that takes place. Exactly. So, I mean, I mean, I used, to, I used to say to the students at the beginning of my course, you know, I could stand here and I could give you 20 hours of lectures that would convince you that all these paranormal phenomena kind of are genuine, you know, that they, they're all real. Because I know they feel well enough to be able to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you why I don't believe in them. But you bear in mind that, you know, you should make your own mind up. You, re you read around the evidence. I'll tell you why I believe what I believe, but I may be wrong. You know, and so that's about as fair as I can be. And when, when we design a test for a psychic claimant, we design it deliberately in such a way that our own biases cannot affect the results. You know, and we, we design the test with the psychic claimant. We get them to sign something in advance saying that it is a fair test of their claim. And then we run the test and then they fail the test. And then they decide it wasn't a fair test after all. <laughs> but that's life. That's life indeed. Um, many people, when they look at kind of psychic phenomena for the first time, or looking at it from a specific point of view would immediately say that everything parapsychological everything telepathy everything that isn't kind of drawing on a, a materialist framework of consciousness is by its very nature pseudoscientific in the way it's researched in the way that it must be that the um that the proponents the proponent experimenters are out for 
confirming their own biases, you know, confirmation bias, or they're just misrepresenting or misunderstanding the data. What do you think to that kind of position? Well, again, I mean, I, I, I'm probably very unusual as a sceptic insofar as I've kind of publicly argued that even though I, if I had to bet my house on it, I would bet against any of so-called psi phenomena actually being genuine. As I said before, I could be wrong about that. And, you know, there are, there are, I can, I, there are kind of, I can certainly say what kind of evidence would convince me that I was wrong. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm probably in a very small minority of one <laughs> among sceptics in arguing that uh, I think parapsychology at its best is a science. I mean, science is basically, it's a method. It's, that's all it is. It's not an established body of facts. You can approach any topic scientifically. I mean, another argument I've used is to say that people like uh, Richard Wiseman, Sue Blackmore, even James Randi, they, they have directly tested paranormal claims. I presume when they do it, they do it in a scientific and well-controlled way, in which case they're doing parapsychology. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I don't see how you can avoid that. So, yeah, I, I think it's quite an unusual position to take, that I, even though I don't believe personally in the paranormal, parapsychology at its best is a science it's certainly a scientific as psychology mm -hmm. matt did you want to jump in i feel like i've got to dive right into the philosophy here i suppose the education that i had very much revolved around understanding everything from that sort of like um physics and then on top of physics you've got chemistry and on top of chemistry you've got biology and it looks like a very beautiful picture it looks like it has the potential to explain everything and the thing that i've sort of um well the thing that's been a thorn in my paw if you like but it's <laughs> it's frustrating but i also get a lot of enjoyment out of it as well so i don't want to uh, go too far with that metaphor as i started to explore the philosophy i realized that if when I said that it felt like something to be me, which is possibly the most generic and um, widely understood way of saying or talking about consciousness, when I say that it feels like something to be me, if that sort of utterance is completely reducible to tiny particles moving according to mathematical laws, then by rights, <laughs> well, there's no need for a me anymore. Please, if there's anything that I'm saying that seems wrong or needs correcting, then do feel free to jump in. It's left me with this absolutely fascinating problem of what do we do about consciousness? The moment that we say that we can't attribute uh, that utterance to those particles, that when we say there really is a subject that experiences things and can talk about that, then you've got something that is causal, but it's not on our current map. So for me, when it comes to things like psi research, the question comes down to, well, it'd be very strange if that force, that conscious force is kind of imprisoned in th my skull. I mean, it seems like it has to have this whole area of brain effect. And then just to say that it's neatly contained, it seems a bit weird. No, I mean, I mean, first off, let me say that um, I think we're kind of a long way from understanding consciousness. Yeah, I, I don't personally feel that we even know the kind of general shape of the answer. It's it's something we've just not yet cracked at all. I mean, obviously, it's something that philosophers have thought about for centuries. A lot of neuroscientists are very, you know, investigating these issues. I think we've made some real progress in, in, in recent decades. Um, but I, you know, I, I, a few years back, probably a couple of decades back, if I'm honest now, I did, I did kind of read around this in this area a lot. And I certainly came to one conclusion that I was never going to solve the mind body problem, you know, um, and, and I kind of recognize, you know, what you said there that I mean, a lot of I, I don't think either. I mean, intuitively, I think we, I, intuitively I'm a dualist, but I don't think dualism makes sense when you start to think about it 
deeply. Uh, then again, I don't think monism, either form of monism, makes much sense either. There are kind of paradoxes and contradictions that are thrown up that I just do not know how to resolve. Um, and I suppose, uh, you know, just in terms of what I've ended up doing with most of my time, most of my, most of my research has kind of probably gone for more tractable, <laughs> answerable problems. Now, some of some of the uh, topics, particularly within parapsychology, and uh, do have obvious implications for for philosophy. I mean. Um, the, the most kind of uh, relevant types of phenomena would be things like out of body experiences. Um, I mean, potentially, it, or, 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 that, or for that matter, kind of any kind of evidence relating to the possibility of life after death, um, that they both have the potential to show that some form of radical dualism must be true, you know? Um, now, having said that, I still probably do stick to what is the majority modern neuroscience view that, you know, and I, I could, it's going to be on my gravestone this, I could be wrong, but, um, but the it's fact that... It's the only that, honest answer to take. Well, it is actually, yeah, absolutely. Um, but the, the, the fact that there is so much evidence that for me suggests that consciousness is dependent on the underlying physical substrate of the brain you know i mean i know i don't need to rehearse those sorts of evidence for you guys you'll be you'll be very familiar with them um and so the question is well you know can can we come up with plausible explanations for what appear to be exceptions to that generalization um so obviously perception during out-of-body experiences um, you, you've got kind of phenomena like reincarnation, uh, mediums who claim they can speak to the dead and so on and so forth. Now, in all of those cases, uh, my feeling is that the evidence doesn't totally hold up to critical scrutiny. There are some cases that are kind of far more intriguing and difficult to, uh, kind of dismiss than others, certainly. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, so you say something like near-death experiences, in very, very broad terms, you've got the kind of notion that this is strong evidence that consciousness can leave the physical body, and maybe it's also evidence for life after death. Uh, and on the other hand, you've got the kind of visions of a dying brain approach, where in fact the brain doesn't even have to be dying, the brain just has to think it's dying. <laughs> if I could just, <laughs> just briefly um, pick up on that, because yeah, I think you're, think you're right, a lot, a lot of people seem to consider that near-death experiences as a whole phenomena are very strong evidence of life after death. And I would I would say that that's, you could partially argue that, but f for me, I mean, near-death experiences are kind of my main go-to phenomena that I know a lot about because I've spoken to a lot of researchers. Um, and to me, it depends what kind of near-death experience you're talking about because those that exhibit only subjective unverifiable um, aspects to them those that go to a transpersonal realm and see certain things and come back regardless of the fact that they all seem to say very similar things of course differing on in terms of how their culture and and their religion whatever ex experience it but those don't really particularly interest me in terms of evidential value the ones that do are those that include veridical perception that take place especially during cardiac arrest where we know mm -hmm. through many years of experimentation what the brain state is um, and we can correlate that the 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 uh, perception that took place we can correlate it to when it took place after the heart stopped and if we can correlate that to what the brain was doing and there are cases like that that to me are do offer the the main evidential value of near-death experiences um uh, among other cases like peak in darien cases if you're familiar with that and um what was that so the last peak in darien cases which is where people will report seeing and communicating with deceased people in a near-death state or in an out-of-body state perhaps right. who they didn't know had died at the time and had no reason to suspect that they were dead at the time right yeah, one yeah, case yeah. one case for instance um that jan dr jan holden told me about or was it gary habermas one of them <laughs> said that uh, someone had come out of their body saw their sister who had said that she had died um and came back to say i saw jenny or whoever 
Um, I think it was within the same day they got a call saying that Jenny had had a had a car crash while she was at university and had died that day. And it's things like that that kind of add it's, a level of interest uh, to me. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, the the, the thing I suppose taking any of those kind of accounts. Um, you, I think you have to take them in the context of, I mean, what we get, what, what we always get, are the, understandably, if you're trying to establish the case for some kind of um, post-mortem survival or, or whatever else it may be, um, you are going to focus on the, on the best cases, the ones that, that are the biggest challenge to skeptics. And that's quite understandable. It's what I would do if I was arguing from that side as well. On the other hand, you do need to look at the wider context of how many times do people, I mean, for example, in, 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 with respect to near-death experience research, there is understandably a huge focus on veridical perception. But what about all those cases where the perception is not veridical? Where, I mean, and, and they are numerous, you know, they're, 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 and, but, but they, they'll, never be, they'll never be written up by the NDE researchers because obviously they don't support the, the kind of notion that, some kind of genuine perception is taking place during the experience. So that, but that, what that does show is that at least some of these experiences are hallucinatory. Now, the challenge then is kind of the ball is back in the court of, um, of the people who are arguing, yes, but some of them aren't. You've really got to then present the very strong, strongest case you can that, you know, some of them are not. And you've got to also kind of provide a plausible explanation for why you should get this situation where some of them are hallucinatory and some of them are real you know i mean and it's it almost raises as many problems as many questions as it as it answers to take account the kind of the, the spiritualist not in you know not in the in you know the sense i mean the word oh, there. I mean, yeah, that, yeah that kind of that kind of explanation um i mean a lot of you know another advantage of the kind of the, the the attempts to explain these things in neuroscientific terms is that we can hopefully try to test them empirically. I mean, it's not easy. I mean, and, and that's the other thing about near-death experience uh, research, that virtually every component of the near-death experience does occur in other contexts where actually it's more amenable to being studied. You know, so um, I don't think there's any obvious reason why the out-of-body experience that occurs during an NDE is going to be any different to any other out-of-body experience that people subjectively uh, have. Um, so let's get some of these people in who say, well, I can have out-of-body experiences more or less at will. I mean, I, I love to go for the simple approach <laughs> wherever possible. If we could get one person who I could sit down in a chair and say, okay, go into whatever state you need to go into, have an out-of-body experience and tell me what's in the next room. And if they could do that, just one, if one person could reliably do that, that's it. Game over. The skeptics have lost. And yet all these claims of astral projection and all these amazing stories we get, there's not been one person who's ever been able to do that. The, and that for well, me speaks there, there, there was a study by Charles Tart with questionable... Um, questionable it was. With Mrs. <laughs> yes. E, but then, well, which I didn't know until I spoke to uh, Stanley Kripner, is that he did successfully replicate that experiment. And I hadn't heard of that, but this is coming from what, the guy. What, that, uh, that Tart himself replicated it? No, or that, that, Kripner? that Kripner replicated Tart's. Um, and right. of course, with, with, the, with, with, with the same subject or? Yeah, uh, no, not the same subject. Not the same. I don't believe it was the same right. subject. He did say okay. that he had, he didn't actually go into much detail, but I think we were strapped for time. So I must really ask him about it. But he did say yeah, that no, he no, did no, replicate it. That's, that's all we'd need. You know, if we could do that and we had somebody who could, re I mean, it doesn't even have to be 100% reliable and replicable if somebody could do that at a consistent level that defied just kind of any other kind of explanation like oh guesswork and so on would be game over i mean i mean i've got huge respect for stan kripner you know i mean he's uh i, I think the main monody studies are, are kind of one of the most uh, one of the strongest bodies of evidence for some for the reality of, of telepathy that there are that, that, that is around and you know uh, i i've not read uh, any kind of compelling sceptical counter-explanations for what was reported there. 
The problem is that there's not also not been that it, because it's so labor intensive and so difficult to carry out that kind of work. There haven't been that many attempts to directly replicate it Indeed. either. You know, and you know, not to mention, as you say, you know, the fact that you were dissuaded from really studying this in the mainstream. You can imagine that acquiring oh, what you'd need the funding and the resource and everything you'd need to do Absolutely. this is, yes is, no i mean yeah. i mean i have a huge sympathy for parapsychologists who are on the other side of the argument because i know the kind of you know, the raised eyebrows that were pointed there can you point a raised eyebrow in a direction i'm not sure anyway you, can, you know you one, the, the, the kind of the, the, there were people who thought you know that, that even though i had the word skeptic tattooed across my forehead you know, there were still people who saw us, well, what's, he, what's he doing research on that for? We all know it's rubbish, you know. I mean, why, why is he doing that? And, you know, the point is, as we would all agree, that these experiences are a part of every human society that we're aware of. So something is there to be explained. Either some of these experiences genuinely are paranormal, in which case we ought to get over, we, the, the conventional scientists, ought to get over our prejudices and just study it the way we'd study anything else. Or there's something really interesting to learn about the way the human mind works. So either way, it's worth taking them seriously. Indeed. But, and I think the, the main underlying question in general for kind of the philosophy of, of how the mind is, is are these phenomena, um, if we take these phenomena, is it more parsimonious to consider that there is kind of a, a physical application or a physical explanation behind how these apparently impossible perceptions take place or is it more parsimonious to say that there are so many different phenomena now that kind of suggest that there's a non-local aspect to mind that maybe we should consider that to be more plausible and that's kind of it's, it's a matter of interpretation of the data it's just what data do we have do we have reliable data and are we asking kind of the right people and the right the right questions well yeah i mean i think i mean what would go a very 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 long way to um kind of pushing me back over the line of belief <laughs> back onto the belief side again would be a single re reliable and again not 100 percent replicable because no. you don't get that in psychology either but some kind of uh technique that we could use and I, and I just don't think that we've ever got there yet in parapsychology. There's a, there's a lot of false storms, you know. I mean, it's, it's this technique. Um, sorry, yeah, on. I mean, even from, from my kind of more positive, I suppose, outlook on, on the on the non-physical as aspect, there is a lot of bunk <laughs> in parapsychological research and a lot of things that aren't done particularly well. Um, so as you say, certainly we need some form of method methodological kind of system that can accurately and consistently show these phenomena to take place i mean i'd love if you'd be interested to to have a conversation or host a conversation between someone like perhaps stanley Krippner or um, stefan schwartz who's also very prominent in this field with yourself just to compare and see what kind of a conversation you'd have because i think that would be very yeah, interesting i mean I, we, I mean possibly it's i mean the the, the situation is I kind of feel that um, what I'm doing in terms of kind of adopting, if you like, the kind of sceptical, anomalistic psychology approach, if it ever gets to a point where parapsychologists can, can come up with this reliable, robust demonstration that these things are real, you know, and they don't fit into it and can't be explained by conventional science, I would have still done them a favour by helping them to sort the wheat from the chaff. You know, and if it turns out that actually it's all chaff, well, it was really interesting chaff anyway, but if there's some real wheat there, I've helped them to, to identify that. And, you know, I'm quite happy for them to get on with that. Having said that, you see, like even at the moment, I'm collaborating with a parapsychologist on a, on a study of, you know, whether or not lucid dreams can be used to foretell future events. So yeah, I, get, I get a bit pissed off. I'm not, I know you, oh, I'm hoping you guys aren't doing it. I get a bit pissed off when, um, you know, skeptics like me are accused of being kind of closed minded because I've put more time into direct testing paranormal claims than virtually all of those people who direct that criticism my way. And, yes. and one of the reasons that I'm still a skeptic is that 
I've never found any convincing evidence, you know, but I've put hours and days and weeks into testing these things. We've tested dowsers. We've tested people who claim that their dreams are, can foretell the future. You know, we've, we've, we have put the time in. Um, and and you, rightly or wrongly, probably wrongly, I think, but one is always more influenced by the stuff you've got direct personal experience of than reports coming from other people that well we did this and we found that you know well yeah well when, when i did it i didn't find that you know i've collaborated you know I, I i was halfway through a collaboration with rupert sheldrake of what was meant to be a really quite ambitious um test of telephone telepathy which was going to be trying so well controlled it ruled out all the criticisms that skeptics usually direct at that research but logistically, it was a nightmare. We got halfway through, the results were coming out bang on chance, and we just ran out of steam. You know? <laughs> but um, it would have been very odd if, uh, it, well, I mean, basically, there was no chance of getting a statistically significant result unless suddenly something very weird had happened in the second half of the experiment, and that in itself would have been. Mm -mm. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, so that never got written up. It never, you know. Um, I've done other stuff that's, you know, can, kind of been based on Rupert Sheldrake's ideas, and I don't replicate the effects that he gets. I'm not, another kind of real problem is that, you know, I'm retired now, so I've not got the same kind of pressure on me as somebody who's still in academia trying to climb up the greasy pole and so on. Um, but, you know, pu publishing in, well, publishing in parapsychology journals isn't great for your cv you know it's not <laughs> it, it's if you are in a psychology department it's publications in parasite uh, sorry in psychology journals that are gonna look good on your cv um and preferably in the so-called top psychology journals now that in itself i mean there's a whole interesting <laughs> tangent to go off there um I mean, one of our other attempts to uh, replicate a, a paranormal effect was a few years back when Bem published his precognition studies um, and encouraged other people to try and replicate. And as you may know, um, myself and Richard Wiseman and Stuart Ritchie, we decided between ourselves that we would all have a go at replicating the experiment with the biggest effect size. Um, now we did have an ulterior motive because we're you know, we're all died in the wool skeptics that you say you know we didn't expect to replicate the results but you know if we had we, we would have published that we we each did an independent replication none of us got the re the same effects that that Ben reported we wrote that up we sent it in to the mainstream psychology journal one of the most respected in the field um because we were thinking this will be an easy way of getting a paper a quick way of getting a paper into a, a top journal you know um the editor rejected it without even sending it out for peer review uh we thought this was that's a political thing on. isn't it well it's the, what the, the argument was that you know we basically we you know we have such a high rejection rate we don't publish just replications and i think there's also you know we don't publish negative findings but when you start and think about that, that means that the, the results that you see in those journals are not representative of the field at all. They are firstly, they're positive. They're always positive findings. So you don't know how many people have failed to get that effect and can't get published. Um, secondly, you know, people bang on about replication being the cornerstone of science. But you try getting a straight replication published and it, it, you can't. Anyway, this this did feed into a big ongoing debate within psychology, which we're still we're still going through, which I see as being very healthy, um, where it was kind of recognised that some of the effects that have been in the mainstream psychology textbooks for donkey's years probably are not genuine effects at all. They're probably not real. Now, you know, how did they how did those how did they get the positive findings in the first place? Occasionally, there is a problem with fraud, as in any area of science but more usually and more kind of insidiously in a way it's what we now call questionable research practices it's not out now making up the data or fiddling the results or anything like that it's just giving yourself the benefit of the doubt you know you tested your hypothesis using one statistical test and it didn't come out the way you wanted it so you thought well i could analyze this using that test instead oh look it's got it you know so how do you write it up that kind of thing 
And there's so many of those decisions that are involved in the whole process, you know, that um, a lot of the results is now recognised that, that get published in, in conventional psychology journals are probably spurious and not genuine effects. Now, if that's a problem for psychology, it's also going to be a problem within parapsychology. So how is it that you can, you know, a lot, I think a lot of skeptics who've never read a parapsychology journal assume that if they picked it up and read a paper, they would immediately spot glaring errors in the methodology. Well, they wouldn't, you know, <laughs> the people who do these experiments are not daft. Uh, and if you take what they've reported at face value, there's no, and there's no reason why you shouldn't, you would be hard pressed to say, well, how come they got this evidence for, for telepathy or precognition or whatever? But there will always be that drip, drip, drip of spurious results, you know? Yeah, that's one thing that always frustrates me. Sorry, Matt, I will come over to you in a minute, but I keep finding things that I want to come um, that One thing that frustrates me, especially with the, what I would call the media skeptics, those that are loud <laughs> uh, and very opinionated online, especially, who when you talk about parapsychology it's immediately in the realms of pseudoscience um and even things like near-death experiences which you could say are parapsychological by nature you know uh, the arguments are these people don't understand the scientific method they don't you know they're extremely biased they're only and you know from my own personal point of view i've spoken to these people you can't get a much more of a scientist than for example dr bruce grayson you can't get much more of a scientist than someone like stephanie schwartz and people like that they know what they're talking about and they know what they're doing i'd and, agree entirely you know just because they have a different rep uh, represent or a different interpretation of the data that they've collected to to somebody else doesn't mean they're wrong it means they've got a no. difference of, of um representation of the data yeah you know no, i mean i mean one the, like one person who had a big influence on me was uh, the late bob morris you know the Kersler, first holder of the Kersler chair of parapsychology up at edinburgh and bob was um i was i was kind of very impressed he turned up he was at a skeptics conference that i attended this was kind of back in my early days of having discovered the joys of skepticism and you know this professor of parapsychology <laughs> turns up oh they're brave you know and uh, one of the speakers who was due to uh, give a, a presentation wasn't couldn't do it for some reason and so he stepped up and gave gave a presentation to this bunch of skeptics and it was really very you know it, it was clear that uh, although you know i mean i got to know bob very well over the years but <clears throat> he was very much um he you know he was on the on the believer's side of the debate so he's always if you ask him the question he'd always answer it with a number from one to a hundred and i think he started off i used to say about 60 but towards the end of his life he was he'd gone in the direction of being more convinced that it was real um but he would welcome skeptics into his lab he would say come and visit Tell us if you see anything wrong and we can tighten up on that, you know, and, and, and that uh, that was really very enlightened. And also um, there were two strands to the research at the Kirstler Parapsychology Unit. On the one hand, directly looking for evidence for psi, for, the, for paranormal uh, abilities, etc. And on the other hand, looking at what looks like psych it's psychic but it isn't you know so he was very well informed on all the skeptics arguments i knew all about cold reading and all of these other things and i thought you know i mean i kind of followed that but with the emphasis the other way around whereas the the kpu mostly focused on trying to come up with evidence to to to, to see whether the paranormal forces might exist but also had a minor stream i mean richard wiseman was bob's first PhD student, you know, so that says a lot. Um, <clears throat> you know, whereas the emphasis for us is always on kind of trying to come up with the non-paranormal explanations, but also putting the paranormal claims to the test sometimes as well. So, you know, so um, yeah, and if we if we ever got results that went against my expectations, well, you know, that's so be it, you know. But uh, it hasn't ever happened, I have to say, you know. I mean, one of the reasons for that, I mean. This whole thing with, with with the with the BEM controversy and all this about questionable research practices, for me, it kind of because I thought about it a lot, obviously, and it kind of it, it answered questions which, with the benefit of hindsight, it looks obvious. Why didn't you realise that at the time? But you know, you get you get claims like um, the so-called sheep goat effect in uh, parapsychology, where 
Um, if the experimenter is a believer in the paranormal, they're much more likely to get positive results than if they're a skeptic. And that's certainly been my experience. You know, I never get, I never get positive results. Um, but the reason for one, one reason for that will be that if I run a test of, say, telepathy, not really expecting to get positive results anyway, I have to admit, I'll, I'll get the results, I'll analyse it the way I said I was going to analyse it, and yeah, not significant, you know. Now, if it was, if I was ask, investigating something that wasn't a paranormal claim, I think I might well have a different attitude. Because what, what happens a lot in psychology is you run your experiment, it doesn't come out the way you want to. And like I said before, you might then say, oh, well, I'll analyse it this way instead. Or I will transform the data. Or I'll think about whether or not any of these data points are outliers. You know, there's all sorts of things like that that I might try to see if I could torture the data until it confesses. Yeah. You know? And not, not necessarily <laughs> in a malicious way, but just kind of a natural not a malicious way. It works. No, this is it. I mm. have published stuff in the past that I can now look back on and think, that probably wasn't really fake. And I didn't do it out of a sense of, oh, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get another paper here. <laughs> I just thought I was kind of, oh, yeah, yeah. I knew, I knew the effect was there to be got out. So, yeah. you know. It's just, what, why is it um, not being shown? Yeah. yeah. I would have had a different attitude if it's a, if, if, like, if it's a conventional psychological study as opposed to parapsychology. With the parapsychology, I'll get the negative result and I'll stop. And that's it. I finished now. <laughs> you know, whereas, and I think that's what, I mean, I think that's what happens with parapsychologists a lot of the time. They, you know, I mean, I know from personal experience, kind of from some PhD students I've had and so on, that, you know, uh, it's even if the results don't come out in line with the kind of initial hypothesis, oh, look, but there's something interesting happening over here in the data that we didn't predict, but it's significant, you know. And yeah, but that's that's not really any evidence of Psy, you know, you, you have to, yeah. So, so those kind of questionable research practices, I say they're a huge problem for psychology, and that's that is being recognised, and so attempts are being made to kind of tighten up on the QRPs themselves, but also um, to recognise the value of replications, both successful and unsuccessful. Um, because basically, there's a lot of stuff that just never gets written up. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's, there are so many, you know, there's such a lot of layers in the selection process. I'm not going to bother writing up something that... I know it's got no chance of getting published in a, in a, in a good journal. What's the point? I've got a lot of other stuff I can write up, you know? Um, so it's always going to be that the cream off the top that you, you, you actually write up. Um, and, you know, as I say, I have had, you know, many, many attempts to replicate effects that have been reported in the parapsychological li literature and by and large, well, not just by and large, I just have never got the same results. I've never replicated those effects. It's not for one to try. And... But maybe, you know, maybe, maybe the parapsychologists are right and it is my negative vibes, you know, but there is, there's nothing I can do about that. I'm stuck, no, of you know. Of course, of course. I really appreciate the, um, well, these sorts of efforts between proponents and skeptics, like the one that you just outlined. I was thinking of actually uh, asking you about this because I'd seen a little bit of this from something I'd looked at before. And then you gave me the answer before the question, which I thought was quite funny, considering the context. And that, that leads into something else. I've been thinking about this because I think that one of the things it felt like to me was that if you're not a scientist yourself, if you're not immersed in this, then you've kind of got one camp saying A and you've got another camp saying B. What is it but a choice if you can't review the literature and whatnot? So <laughs> I've actually uh, done something about this. I thought, well, what is it that I can actually do? Because professionally, I'm, well, a web developer. I, did, um, I did think for a while, by the way, I'm sure you've had this before, that you were a professional wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> I typed your name in, obviously, as you would to Google, and there's, there's all this stuff about this wrestler. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> I know what you mean. Consciousness, woo, nice. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. sorry <laughs> Never done any professional wrestling. If you search my name into Google, you'll probably get some <laughs> Irish winos or something, McKennany. <laughs> all I've ever seen is just bars. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, got on that That's one. all right. So... I'm just embarking on a little bit of a project myself. 
I'm trying to come up with a way of making it as easy as and as cheap as possible to do some, well, various psi experiments, depending on which one seems like the most likely to produce results or seems like the most interesting way of getting into it. And I've started off with Dean Radin's original 1997 presentiment experiment. The idea behind the whole thing as well is to make it as open as possible. So there's already a repository for the software that's on GitHub, so you can have a look at it for yourself. The idea is that anyone should be able to come along and pick it up and have a go for themselves. I, um, it's pretty much all ready. And I've already done a few experiments through it. And I can see that it started to get quite interesting as I go down this road. I could pick one particular graph and I could go, aha, this is it. And then <laughs> I could have another graph the next time round that has, well, exactly the opposite. I suppose what I'm curious about is, as someone who, um, well, as you've had quite an interesting career looking at these things, what advice would you have for me starting out trying to do something a bit different in that sort of area with these sorts of experiments, trying to make it ex trying to make it as accessible as possible and things like that. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm sure you're aware of this. I mean, Rupert Sheldrake has a lot of uh, experiments on his website that you know that, that the user can have a go at, or they can use in schools and so on and so forth. I mean, one thing, one kind of kind of negative aspect of doing that is, of course, that you don't know from the data you collect. You might end up with a load of data, but you don't know what the quality of it is, and that is really difficult. You know, I mean, if you've got some kind of experiment that's supposed to be a telepathy experiment but you don't know that you know fred and his mate were sitting next to each other look at each other's laptops it completely undermines it and if that data then goes in with the general pool you've no way of identifying it so i was always a little bit dubious about that now i think in theory it may well be possible to come up with experimental designs that are not susceptible to that i mean i suppose particularly with respect to kind of precognition type studies that's the kind of obvious thing that springs to mind there um and yeah potentially it might you know you, you might be able to get some kind of interesting intriguing data um, I'll, let do. <laughs> I'll let you know if i do <laughs> please do um but as i say uh yeah certainly when it comes to kind of say uh, rupert's stuff whenever he presents this kind of data that is collected in these ways, you know, the one potential obvious criticism from the skeptics, including myself, would be, well, you know, you really don't know that on what the quality of that data is at all. You've no way of knowing it. Um, now, it might be useful for kind of individuals to, you know, to, to, to use it just for their own satisfaction to see, you know, I mean, and if then obvious, because I mean, again, I, I'll get contacted by people who say, oh, you know, I've got this ability to do this. And, you know, one of the first things I'll say is, well, have you actually tested it under, you know, even, even you don't have to be a kind of rigorous, you know, fancy setup. Have you ever tried like in a, in a double blind way to see whether you really can do this? Um, and a lot of the time they haven't. I mean, one one example I'll give you. There was a, a chap that got in. Well, in fact, I was contacted by the JREF, the James Randi Educational Foundation. Somebody had approached them with a view to getting the million dollars when the, the million dollar challenge was, was still up and running. And um, the, the JREF insist that before you go for the full million dollar challenge, you pass a preliminary test carried out by somebody that they know and trust. And so we've carried out quite a lot of these preliminary tests, which is a kind of really good wheeze on their part because they never get past the preliminary stage. So they don't have any work to do, you know. Um, but this guy uh, was a dowser and uh, he'd, he'd been in touch with them and the JRF had got in touch with me and said, you know, would you, would you set up a, a, a test? Um, and I kind of said, yes, in principle. But I mean, I was, it was when I still worked. I had a job. <laughs> and, um, they, uh, I was just too busy. I couldn't ever get around to it. I had a kind of preliminary chat on a phone, on, uh, on the phone. And we came up with a, he had a very specific claim. He claimed that he could, with his dousing rods, detect where earth had been disturbed. 
So it might be flowing water, but it might just be that somebody has dug a hole and then covered it over. He would be able to detect that. But I said, well, that's, you know, what, we, what you could do if you had a walkway with 10 one meter squares and we sort of selected one at random, we dug a hole and then we covered them all with wooden boards and you go along with the dousing rods. And if you can detect which one that was happening, there's one chance in 10. So if we have three runs like that, you've got them all right. That's one chance in a thousand. You know, that'd be really impressive. Um, but obviously it all has to be done under double blind conditions. And then I just didn't, we didn't get our, I didn't get around to take it any further. And in the end, I think just out of exasperation, he, he got into it to say, I'm going to set it up for myself. <laughs> okay, so well, yeah, yeah, but hang on, that can't count as a double blind test, you know, if I've not been, you know. Yeah, but I just want to show you that it works. And, and I told him when, he, when, I, when we spoke, I said, look, I, you know, I, I'm sure he wasn't a, a, a fraud. He genuinely believed he had this gift. And he was one of these people, again, this is quite interesting with Dowsers, that in my experience, there's kind of two different camps. I mean, a lot of the people who are into dowsing are also into kind of crystals and angels and all sorts of other new age stuff. But there's others that very much see themselves as, I will use the word men, men of science, because they usually are men. Um, and and don't, don't go along with all this kind of nonsense that this lot over here believe in. You know? And he was very much from this camp. He was a, his background was as a chemist and, you know, he's a... Um, but I told him all about the ideomotor effect, and that's what I thought was probably going on in the, you know, in these, uh, in, when, with respect to dowsing. And uh, he, he, yeah, 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 you know, he listened politely, but didn't have any effect, no, you know. No, of and anyway, he set up his own test. Uh, he invited myself and a number of the other, a number of other people from the local skeptics group, and a load of his friends and family. And I think it was Milton Keynes, as I recall. We all went down. He picked me up from the station. And I kind of said to him, have you actually you know, just done a few little tests where you didn't know what the right answer was before you did it? Oh, no, 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 no. So, <laughs> and then, of course, he went ahead. I mean, I'm still all this time thinking, you know, even if he passes the test, it's not double blind. But he failed his own test. <laughs> he yeah, failed dude. the test that he had set up. With, and, and it was, it was, I mean, he was, because he was just so sure that it was going to work. And it was kind of, uh, you know, I mean, I, it was em embarrassing for him. Uh, he'd gone to such a lot of effort, you know, and, uh, but didn't take that simple step of just testing himself beforehand. Now, something like you're thinking of putting on there would be a great tool. You know, I could direct people to your website and say, well, have a go at this test on this website, see what happens. And if you can pass that, then, you know, maybe it's worth looking further into it. Because a lot of it, there are lots of reasons, as I'm sure you guys will be aware of, that people can fool themselves into thinking that they've got some kind of special gift, you know, confirmation bias, all those other things that come in. But if you test it formally <clears throat> in, in the correct way, then hopefully you've ruled out those kind of biases. So it'd be a very useful resource in that respect and, you know, go for it. And if you could find somebody, you know, if you could use it as a kind of screening for selecting a sample that you could then do other more kind of well-controlled stuff on, great. Yeah, go for it. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um... Well, I'm starting out with the pre-sentiment experiment. That's, that's, that's the intro for a second. That's another one that I've never seen a really kind of compelling, sceptical counter-explanation for. You know, I mean, I, 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 we have done, we tried to replicate that stuff and we didn't get those effects. But, you know, if, if other people are, then there's something there to be explained. But sorry, I just wanted to interrupt the... the that's all right, that's all right. There are a few areas that are a kind of, you know, I think do provide kind of the strongest challenges to the sceptics. And even though I would say the kind of more uninformed sceptic, I hate it when you hear a sceptic saying, you know, oh, there's no evidence for telepathy. You think, of course there's bloody evidence. It's the quality of the evidence that we're talking about, you know, and that is a much more difficult decision to make. It's the same with the often repeated you know, statement that there's no evidence for survival of consciousness after death. There is. Yeah, it mean, just depends on how, what your, what yes, your exactly. standard of evidence is. I agree entirely. And then this is, I mean, then this is the other, you know, uh, another issue that, you know, we, non, none of us have a kind of God-given uh, 
view on this that we know you know we know with absolute certainty that all this stuff over here is true and this stuff over here isn't true and we all have different criteria i don't know are you guys familiar with signal detection theory have you ever i'm not i'm not going to try and explain signal detection theory in two minutes so i'm not going to do it but the basic idea is that if you have um Oh, well, no, sorry. I am going to try and explain the state of the theory. Well, <laughs> I was you, hoping you uh, would. <laughs> if you've got a situation where you, you, you're trying to separate signal from noise, you know, kind of regardless of what the signal and the noise might be, but to, to sort of give an example that's kind of easy to understand, certainly back in the day when uh, radars were kind of a bit noisy and that sometimes appear to show a signal, but it wasn't a real signal and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, then this was... Uh, this was a real problem. How do you kind of identify the real signals from the things that might look like signals, but they're not? Um, now, what what you can think of is kind of if you've got kind of two distributions. Here you've got the kind of uh, th this is the noise normal distribution. This is the signal plus noise normal distribution, and they overlap. So there's an area there where you know it, it could be either. Sometimes it's a very clear, definite signal. Sometimes it's very clear there's no signal there. But the other thing to take into account is the. it's not just the degree to which they overlap. It's also the uh, criterion that you are using to make the decision. So if there's an imminent threat of incoming missiles, you want people to flag up anything that might even be a lot of them will be false alarms. But you want to make sure that you, you know, catch, you catch the genuine. Yeah. Uh, missiles as they're coming in on the other hand if it's extreme if it's another kind of scenario where uh, false alarms are really really costly and it doesn't matter if you miss the odd genuine signal you, you you're moving your criteria right so uh, yeah so that's so signal detection theory is a way of kind of modeling that and trying and showing the statistics behind it and how you can separate one from the other um and i've forgotten why i was talking about signal detection theory now <laughs> i genuinely have <laughs> um what were we talking about earlier guys how do we get into this i'm trying to i'm trying to think back yeah, no, I've, gone, I've gone off on one again i've no well, it's all right i mean it's it's interesting to me because no, one of the no, things... it's come back sorry it has come back but you know one of the different and again this is in in um a book that uh bob morris is one of the co-authors of where he's talking about the difference between uh what he calls tough-minded and tender-minded individuals and the 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 the, the Tough-minded individuals are those who, whose love for the truth is so strong that they want to make sure that all of their beliefs are based on really, really strong evidence uh, and they don't end up believing anything that's not true. But in the process, they will be kind of, they'll, yeah, they'll, they'll reject some things that are true. Um, the the tender-minded are those that have a different criterion um, and they want to make sure they don't miss anything that's true. And so they will have accept get everything that's true, but they'll also get a lot of things that aren't true. And that's basically, you know, a difference between the skeptics and the believers in this argument. I think that I will set my criteria as such that I will almost certainly have standards of evidence that are so high that I will reject some things that turn out to be true because I will only accept them if the evidence as it stands is very very strong and you know but that that's a kind of it's almost a personal preference rather than anything else it's kind of you know i suppose you know, we call it temperament or whatever sorry i went waffled on a bit there over to you guys <laughs> darren did you have anything in mind because the only thing i was going to add to that myself was that um i do have two variations of the pre-sentiment experiment one where i take 20 trials because i while i realized more trials are better. You want people to sit down there and do the test, you know. Um, but I've also got one with 10 trials where they don't actually get to see an emotional or a peaceful image. They just see a random colour. Because I was thinking along the lines of, well, what does noise look like? Well, I, so I thought, well, we'll have to collect some of that as well then. So this way, at least, I've got some idea of what they might look like in comparison. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to check to see whether my cat is trying to get in, if you don't mind, guys, because I thought, I, yeah, oh, I could hear someone. You can always edit this bit out. <laughs> Let me make a note of where it is, because otherwise I'll be searching for it. Uh, oh, there he is. 
Right, Darren, you said you wanted pets. Yep, there he is. That's uh, oh, there he is. What, Can you see him? Name? Ted. Say again. Come on, Ted. Can I say hello? Ted, there right. he is. Hello, yeah. Ted. Oh, he's a golden hello. goldie. A lovely, lovely boy. <laughs> he is. I'd let Cody in, but he'd be non-stop kind of barking and going mad. So I, I better <laughs> no, not. <laughs> Ted will settle down in a minute. He may try and kind of. He'll probably get a squeezy tennis ball out. You know, but oh, hey, what you do? that's fine. More pets <laughs> the better. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. The the thing I was going to ask um, while I remembered it was you were talking about double blind. I mean, first of all, I'd love to see a discussion between you and and Stephanie Schwartz, who who <laughs> believes that these uh, these things have been shown beyond reasonable doubt yeah, i think that'd be incredibly it's interesting. So interesting i mean I, I used to again as part of my course i used to um yeah that's the question kind of right at the beginning saying how is it that clearly intelligent people can look at the same body of evidence and come to diametrically opposed opinions about what the reality is and i used to quote dean radin at one end of the spectrum and david marks at the other you know and uh, uh interestingly David Marx seems to have modified his opinion a bit. I've not had the chance to read his uh, his latest book fully. I've dipped into it. And, um, you know, whereas he, I would have put him down as a very hardline sceptic, I may be misquoting him here because I've not read the full book. And, you know, if I, if I am, forgive me, David. Um, but it, it appears to me that he's kind of now arguing that Psy is real. But it cannot be demonstrated in, in under control conditions. It's just something that happens kind of in real life, uh, unpredictable moments. This is an interesting position to take. Yeah. So uh, and again, based on, you know, a, a personal experience that he has had relatively recently. So mm. um, that's I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Especially common with near death experiences as well. And any other really yeah. e other STE, you know, spiritually transformative experience. Once people have had these experiences, they completely shift into the realm of you know this wasn't hallucination this wasn't this was more real well, sometimes real they do i mean so because well, i mean again famously, famously freddie ayer the philosopher had a near-death experience and he was always you know he was always a very outspoken skeptic um and initially was kind of quite flummoxed by it and, and, I, and again i've seen that being quoted by some people saying you know that he was somebody who didn't believe in near-death experiences even when he had one you know but actually i, I say to, again something i used to say to the students look if i come in next week and i have had a near-death experience in the meantime before i see you again and i come in saying all that stuff that he was saying was rubbish all stuff i was saying was rubbish it's all wrong you know it, all this stuff all the paranormal stuff is real there's no more reason to accept that from me than anybody else. You know, it's, I mean, it's like the kind of, um, you know, what, what, you know, even Alexander, you know, makes no difference. You know, nobody, nobody's saying that neuroscientists can't have any experience or philosophers, you know. And Freddie Air, after a week, had decided it was a hallucinatory experience. After all, it was really interesting. And, and clearly, for many people, it's profound and life changing. But that doesn't rule out the possibility that it is a hallucinatory experience. I suppose that's the difference between personal experience and kind of verifiable research yeah. is that personal experience can be, I suppose, a form of personal proof to the individual that what they experienced yeah. was real. And more often than not, you know, they do permanently shift to believing that this did actually occur. Many oh. don't, but most do. And Absolutely. to them, to them, that's, you know, there's no question in it. There's absolutely no reason to believe that this wasn't true. But that's not evidence to other people when you're trying to convince others, because it it's a subjective yeah. thing, yeah. even yeah. if there are, you know, yeah. veridical aspects to it. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's the point you made earlier that, uh, yeah, that this is why really, I mean, out of all the different kind of aspects to the near-death experience, it's the out-of-body experience mm. that for me, is the one that potentially could prove the paranormality of the phenomenon. Not not even you know, out-of-body uh, experiences as they are, but those that have veridical information. And yeah. especially those during cardiac arrest where we know that the brain was registering flat on an EEG and those perceptions shouldn't have taken place. I mean, Pam Renner, I mean, I would, for instance... Well, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, I, mean, I have to pick you up on that because that is a point that I have <laughs> gone on about. Um, that, you know, I think... I mean, there's kind of there's kind of two main planks of evidence i would say two main strands of evidence that uh people who argue that um ndes are paranormal 
kind of uh, go for. And one is the the apparent veridicality of some of the experiences. But again, I would say that there are there are kind of plausible counter explanations there. Things like the fact that we know that people sometimes regain consciousness to some degree during operations. Um, Anesthesia. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I. Like that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I tend, I mean, I, I tend to very much go along with the kind of Sue Blackmore approach on all this stuff, you know. I mean, I, I sometimes think that you know, kind of most most of my research career has been a series of footnotes to Sue Blackmore, you know. <laughs> she's, she's always been there before me and done it better, you know. Yeah. Um, the only the only but, problem I find with with Sue's kind of research is that it's she hasn't been in this field now for what 15 years or something something like that oh, she's come back she's back is in she, now she's back in now is she she's, not, she's, she's, she's i mean and what brought her back in was the more recent research on uh, the like out of body experiences i mean she 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 kind of left the field all those years ago because she said it's never going to answer the questions i'm really interested in about the nature of consciousness and so on um but then you know she she has actually come back in she's written uh, i've got it somewhere well i've on the <laughs> it'll be up on that shelf there so i'm not going to go and get it now it's too high um she she's had she's got a book out recently relatively recently about two three years um on all the more recent research and out-of-body experiences because she has now decided that actually all that stuff does answer a lot of the questions oh begins to answer those questions about the next is that seeing myself that's the one yeah oh bloody yeah. hell he's come in sorry i knew he'd get in one way or another <laughs> Pardon, my friend. You did say you wanted pets. Oh, I yeah. provided them. this. This little he's gonna, Tom. He's going to come around this side now. This is Tom. <laughs> come on, Tom. Wait. Come on. If you're getting on the table, come and say hello. <sighs> right. <laughs> I did say to my wife that he did say, "Here we go." Hello, the Tom. pets. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there he is. I he in particular is just. Uh, he gets in on all the Zoom calls I ever make, don't you? <laughs> hello. Bless him. Hello. <laughs> well, since we're getting our pets, I'll go and grab Cody to say hello as well. All right, yeah, we may as well. Yeah, go on. let's do it. Have you got any pets, Matt? I don't. I quite like the idea of pets, but I uh, don't really like the responsibility of them. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> they are a responsibility. They definitely are. I don't know whether these bits are going to get edited out or not, but I did actually, I did actually ask Darren about. Um, a kind of interruption from pets acceptable or not and he said oh yes the more the merrier well he's he's got his way <laughs> oh he's cody yeah who's this code who's that hey look at that <laughs> stick him up to the other camera so he can say hello to the other camera there he is <laughs> wait wait till he spots the cat <laughs> yeah yeah you're not that you're a bit thick aren't you cody you're not you wouldn't recognize a cat if you saw it would you right look at this you're just an attention seeker aren't you and that's right anyway do carry on I can't remember. No, um, oh, Susan Blackmore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, Ways of Seeing. That's the one, yeah. But, I mean, again, she, you know, she's actually come back into the, well, to the field, at least with respect to the kind of out-of-body experience and near-death experience stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the arguments that she presents and others as to, uh, you know, why we might have some um, veridical accounts but they don't necessarily have to involve anything paranormal um, and and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I kind of find those arguments convincing, whereas possibly other people don't. But, but the other the other yeah. line of argument is this thing about um, how can <clears throat> how can people have these complex cognitive experiences when they're you know when they are brain dead? Well, mm. actually, or at least first off, on EG. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, again, yeah. Usually, we do, we have no idea whether the EEG is flat when they're taking place because they're not rigged up to an EEG machine. Um, it could be something that is happening while they're going into that state or coming out of that state. Also, I mean, Jason Braithwaite presents kind of, I for me, again, I'm going to find the evidence more convincing than you guys might because. It, it suits my prior beliefs, except that, you know, um, there's certainly evidence that 
you can have quite a lot of activity at subcortical areas that won't be recorded at all on scalp EEG. So it might look like someone's totally flatlined. It doesn't mean there's no brain activity at all. Yeah. Although, is it, is, um, it, is it not true, just while you mention that, is it not true that um, higher cognitive functions and, and thought and you know that sort of thing is reliant on cortical activity and the further down you get into the brainstem kind of regions is more kind of the reptilian I think, I think as a kind of as a kind of generalization but there is evidence that you can have kind of rich hallucinatory experiences that are driven by you know subcortical activity uh, and even that you can have a, a, even that you can have cortical activity that's recorded using other techniques that doesn't show up on the eg so it's much more complicated than the way that it's presented you know the um and then finally the, there's the kind of recent research that shows that even in situations where you do kind of get you know you, the heart stops you get kind of flat line activity and then there's this burst of activity that takes place that can last between 30 seconds and three minutes you know maybe that's where the near-death experience is happening i mean i yeah, yeah i don't know i've not got definitive answers here but i think that there are enough possible uh reasons you know until those can be ruled out i think i mean it, i think it's very very premature to be saying you know these these kind of activity this this kind of experience can you know couldn't possibly be taking place it, it's a misrepresentation of the way the true state of affairs basically you know at, mm. at our current state of knowledge so those that do present the cases that seem to kind of defy any possible natural explanation um some that see veridical perceptions that take place in locations far removed from their physical body for instance while their eyes are taped shut things like that would would argue that although these although you can you can say that you know there are many more that that are inaccurate it's a white crow effect so you can say all the all crows are black until you see one white and then you can no longer argue and it doesn't matter if somebody goes then, and sees you know yeah you then know. there's no, I, I agree. I agree with the basic the basic point you're making there. But th there's other kind of factors that then come in. You know, I mean, one thing that I you, you become very aware of is, you know, and, and again, this is just a, I don't know what, how you how you can possibly get around this problem. Well, I've got one suggestion, but I'll come to that in a second. We usually get in these accounts quite often long after the experience itself has taken place so we've got issues about you know the reliability of memory and so on and so forth uh, the degree to which um and any kind of details that actually weren't accurate have kind of been dropped from the story you know because there's a natural human tendency to want to tell a good story um all, all that kind of stuff comes into play i mean when uh vin Pam, pim van lommel first reported his results in the lancet i was contacted to uh kind of provide a commentary a more skeptical commentary and one of the suggestions i came up with at the time was that you know the, the, like some of the stuff i've already said but also the possibility that some of these accounts might be based upon false memories um which i think at the time was a reasonable suggestion to put forward but um you know, if you, if you had been in hospital and you'd come close to death and then you'd read subsequently about these accounts of near-death experiences and imagined if that happened to you and then end up believe, re believing the thing you've imagined. But I, I now uh, I'm quite satisfied and I've kind of gone on record. Well, I've gone on record. I've got I'm right. Uh, I must plug my book. I'm writing a book at the moment, a popular science book uh, called The Science of Weird Shit. Um, <laughs> Straight and this point. will be coming out. This will be, yeah, and this will be coming out next year. And there's a chapter on near-death experiences, not body experiences, and so on. Um, uh, but I have put on record that I don't believe that they are false memories. By and large, people seem to remember the actual experience itself pretty, pretty accurately. Mm. And uh, to, to but, kind of build on that, there is also research that's been done that shows that, um, as, you, as you say, memories are kind of mundane or even somewhat kind of emotionally triggered experiences that take place do change certainly over a period of months and years. But with near death experiences, um, if the person was asked kind of the day that they had the experience, what took place and then 20 which years is, down the line, 
they ask again no detail changes it's exactly worth no i mean and, and, and this is the, this is also the advantage of doing those kind of uh, studies on cardiac arrest units and so on and so forth and this, this is the other thing i was going to mention the um the putting the hidden targets oh, up above. Pan, yeah. i'm a huge supporter of that i mean i know it, i i think it sounds a bit kind of monty pythonish but i'm a huge supporter of it that um i like that idea a lot as well but I've heard this really interesting retort, which is, well, if you find yourself out of your body and goodness knows you're trying to register what the hell's going on, you might not necessarily think, oh, I I must check out the room and see if there are any hidden things that I should take notice of. Well, I mean, I I actually, when when, uh, this uh, programme was first announced, I did a a news thing with Sam Parnia and he actually said at the time, you know, if after you know four years or whatever, um, nobody has reported accurately what any of these hidden targets are, that would show that it's a hallucinatory experience. And I came back and said, no, it wouldn't. No. <laughs> no. Absolutely wouldn't. If I was in that situation and, and I suddenly found my consciousness leaving my body, I'm not sure that my top priority would be to, oh, I'll pop over there and have a look at that hidden target, you know. Uh, so, you know. Are you familiar with the research done by Penny Sartori as well? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, who who um, kind of added a, a level of control by asking those who both had near-death experiences and those who didn't, or at least don't remember having them, to describe what happened during the procedure. And she she mentioned that the results were that those who did have experiences were in the ninety percent level of, of accurate. Whereas those that didn't have couldn't were, were nowhere near. You know, they're describing what they'd seen no, on the television and things like that. No, no. But I mean, if you can hear, I mean, the, the sense that comes back, if you're regaining consciousness, the first sense to come back is hearing. And in that kind of situ- context, the, 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 you know, the idea is, and again, this is kind of Sue Blackmore's stuff, you know, um, you, would, you have a mental model or, you know, e- even during normal waking consciousness, you have a mental model of the world around you and your place in it. And what you accept as reality is the kind of, you know, you, you, you adopt one of these models as being reality. And usually it's going to correspond quite well to external reality because you're constantly updating it on the basis of incoming sensory information. But you can get certain situation. I mean, the, the idea is that this model is generated both by incoming bottom up sensory information but also top-down influences, what you know about the way the world works, what you expect, what you believe. And there's a constant kind of interaction between these two. And under normal circumstances, in normal working consciousness, uh, there's, a, there's a pretty damn good match between your model of reality and your place in it and you know, what, what objective reality, for what that might mean. Um, but under certain circumstances, you might adopt a model of reality that isn't based on you know, being constantly updated by this incoming century information, or at least it's a distorted version of that. And so, uh, you know, as, as Sue points out, the kind of world of the outer body experience is very much like the world of imagination. You can move vast distances in a fraction of a second. You can fly, you can, you can go through walls, you can change in size, all of those kinds of things. Um, and, and again, the fact that, uh, a lot in a, in a lot of out of body experiences, not just the ones that occur during near death experiences, but spontaneously as well. What is experienced is a distorted version of reality. It's not quite right, you know. Um, there's, there are accounts of uh, near death experiences where uh, people kind of meet talking insects or mythological beings, and so on and so forth. As I was saying before, you know, and you've got to consider the whole all of the kind of the full range of experiences because sometimes just by chance something's going to match and something that really that has happened in reality and that might be influenced by expectations it might just be pure coincidence it might be all sorts of other things but you've got to consider the whole whole body of evidence where it lies yeah and you know overall is it such that you feel there's no other way that that could be explained other than it was a paranormal event, you know. Um, oh, it's all, yeah. A, a good example of that, actually, I know we're talking about individual cases here, but it's just one that kind of highlights no, what we're talking to, about. You have to. Um, 
Dr. Gary Habermas, if you're familiar with his work, um, not overly so. He's a near-death researcher, effectively, um, or a, he's a he's a New Testament biblical scholar who also has a big interest in near-death experiences. And he was saying about um, a particular case of a, of a woman, a well-known case, who came out of her body during a surgery or a cardiac arrest. I think it was surgery, um, and she had a compulsive thing of remembering long numbers. And she came out of her body and saw a a serial number which was on the back of a of a machine, uh, an anesthesia machine or something like that. That was it wasn't visible from where she was because it was around the back of the machine. And she mm-hmm. said that because she had this compulsion, she saw the serial number of the machine and memorized it, twelve digits. And she came back, wrote it down, and said to this woman, "Can you report? Could you could you check this? This is with the serial number on this certain machine." And she said, "You know, number for number, it was it was perfect." And not only did that change her life, but it also changed the life of the nurse that went to check because it yeah, completely yeah. flipped and you know things like that that again as you mentioned oh, yeah. things that could occur by chance if that case is is true and it is exactly as described that would be the kind of a white crow in that that line of reasoning i think you're right you know but again there's that big if there um i mean again you you're probably familiar with um sue's account of um a, a near-death experience in a woman with congenital blindness yeah. that was in one of Larry Dossie's books. You know, I mean, uh, so, I mean, for anybody who's listening who isn't familiar with that story, uh, the, the story was, I mean, what, what was completely amazing, was somebody had an, an out-of-body, uh, there's now an account in a book by Larry Dossie of uh, an out-of-body experience in which the woman who had it could describe in detail what was happening in the operating room that she was in uh down to the kind of let the, the the fact that the surgeon had odd socks on on that day to describe the conversations everything that was happening blah 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 uh, and what was really really amazing was that this woman was congenitally blind you know and, and of course you kind of think wow that's incredible and that's yeah. obviously what sue thought at the time that she contacted larry dossie and he said oh yeah no i just made that up just to illustrate just for illustrative purposes you know, now I'm not saying that it's the same in this case, but uh, yeah, I just don't know. There are these few cases here and there. Did Larry Dossie actually? Did he? Did he write that case down as if it was a fact, factual, or did he outline? Yeah, no, no, no. Did genuinely thought that oh, it was a real case because she wanted to get in touch, and you know, yeah. preferably tried to get to interview the woman whose whose account it was. And, and he was quite candid about it. He wouldn't try to hide it. He, didn't, he obviously didn't think he'd done anything wrong. But for anybody reading that book, they would think that was a that was a genuine account. I'd be interested um, in reading that section of that book just to see if there were any kind of subtle hints. That no, it, that's it true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, know, just to see. Do, I mean, again, do feel free. You know, I mean, it might be the case that, that Sue's presenting it in a way that favours her argument. But no, well, that's, that's not, I mean, not necessarily what, what I'm saying. saying but, yeah. was as well of where. I mean, there was a there was another uh, an, another one. As I say, I was a big supporter of the Aware program. Um, I, I probably acted as a referee on the grant proposal. I probably helped them to get the money, you know. Um, but I was a, I was a big supporter of that. And um, the the you know, I think it was a, an account of. It might have been. A, I can't remember. This, to be fair, I can't remember whether it was in one of their papers or in a paper by Pim Van Lommel. Um, but there was, there was a kind of uh, an instance that was, it was report. It was said that during the pilot phase of the study, it was reported that a veridical uh, NDE had been reported. Um, and now anybody kind of reading that, because I have gone back and looked at this one, would, would think that this, NDE had occurred during the pilot phase but that's not what was actually said <laughs> and it turns out that this was a case that was reported during the pilot phase right, but had in right. fact occurred many 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 years before now whether that was a deliberate attempt to kind of mislead the reader or whether it was just clumsily worded you we can make your own mind that. up but I certainly would have read that as this is something that happened happened during the pilot phase not something that was reported during the pilot phase um and it's that kind of thing that 
I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I it, mean, it, it makes you pause to question, doesn't it? Yeah, and I, th- and mm-hmm. I think we should do that on both sides of the argument. You know, don't don't accept. It's very. I mean, obviously, we've all got confirmation bias. I mean, it's the most pervasive cognitive bias that there is. Um, I am very, very familiar with all the kind of cog- uh, arguments against the paranormality of these types of phenomena. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I would be because I pay more attention to those and I remember those. And uh, yeah, you know, so whereas the other side of the and Matt would be the, the probably the exact yeah. opposite, more familiar yeah. with the proponents. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, but that's why it's important that both sides work mid- together. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why you, you need that kind of, I think for real progress, there has to be kind of collaboration between the, uh, the more moderate people uh, in the centre ground on either side. Um, maybe, maybe we'll make some progress. I mean, the problem is, of course, that, again, I accept the argument that um, compared to kind of conventional areas of research, the number of person hours that's gone into parapsychology is minuscule. You know? yeah. um, on the other hand, if some of these effects were as reliable as some of the pe- the claimants may make out that they are, it would be trivially easy to demonstrate them. There would be no controversy. It had been established by now. You know, mediums and psychics typically claim 90% plus accuracy, and then you put it to test and... Mm. Doesn't happen. Do, on, on mediumship, are you familiar with Julie Byshell and her research? I'm, only I know the name. I'm not not familiar with the yeah, research. That, that would be an interesting one to look at because that was quadruple blinded studies, which yielded apparently statistically oh, significant right. results. And this was with mediums, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I um, I in the chapter, I've got a chapter on mediums, and I do refer to that as being kind of you know recent, apparently strong evidence. You know, I mean, what, what we want, obviously, is for independent researchers to try and replicate those effects and blah, yeah, blah, blah, we'll take from there. But yes, I would also put that in the uh, the category of um, n- not, you know, n- no obvious flaws that, that I could see, you know. Mm. And I know Caroline Watts had a look at that research and she feels That's the right. same. Mm. I re- you know, again, I've... I've I mean, Caroline is another great example. I mean, she's kind of a, a chip off the old Bob Morris block. You know, she's, um, she, I think she's genuinely open-minded. She's, she's very aware of the sceptical arguments and she, but she, she's, she's published stuff that appears to support the reality of paranormal phenomena. So, mm. Sorry, Matt, you wanted to, you wanted to speak? Oh, right, yes. Something? I was really curious as to, well... One of the things that I've noticed about you, Chris, as I've been looking through and over the general sceptical landscape is that, and I don't mean to um, knock anyone else, but I think you in particular seem to have a very open-minded, let's engage with the other side. And I really like that. So thank you so much for bringing that. I'd agree. I'm curious as to where you feel your standard of evidence would lie. I know it's not necessarily the easiest thing to just sort of answer on the spot. As I'm paying attention and going through this, I feel like those sorts of individual reports, uh, if they're real when they happen naturally... There's something about the quality of how we can be sure of the data in those situations, which just makes it a little bit, maybe I'd like to on some level, but I just, I've seen too much before uh, of people saying that things go on and then it never really amounts to anything. What would be, what could you imagine? Just trying to imagine it right now. What would be the standard that would make you shift your position? What would well, be the defining I mean, factor? There, there is a problem here because I mean, like, if, if David Marks is is, if my reading of David Marks is right, um, and 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 uh, and what he's saying in my reading of him is right, um, then there is a real problem that you know, uh, sign may be real, and I may never accept it because what would really really convince me is evidence from a well controlled study. And if it only ever occurs spontaneously in unpredictable ways, 
I'm never going to capture that. Okay, I mean, and that's the problem because as a psychologist, yeah. um, and especially as a psychologist with an interest in the accuracy of eyewitness testimony and false memories and all this other stuff, yes, I know you're there. <laughs> um, then uh, I, I kind of accept that there there is a there is a kind of real issue there. I mean. It, it, it strikes me in particular, again, when I was kind of um, writing my chapter on ghosts, you know, by almost by definition, it's an anecdotal experience. You know, there's. Um, and so would anything ever convince me that, that, that ghosts were real? Well, maybe not directly, but it, I think it is possible to carry out well-controlled studies of mediumship. It's difficult, very difficult, but it can be done and it has been done and it is being done. Um, and kind of really compelling evidence from that would kind of support the idea that, well, yes, spirits do survive and they are contactable. And therefore that adds to the plausibility that maybe ghosts are real as well. You know, so it'd be kind of indirect evidence. But any kind of individual anecdotal account of a ghostly encounter is probably never going to do it for me. Mm. And, you know, I do worry about that because um, I don't like the idea that, I hold some views and beliefs that are actually non-falsifiable. You know, I like I like to be able to say, as I said before, with respect to the idea that kind of skeptics are all closed-minded, and I mean some are, um, but the I'm idea that they all are. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, for me, and a really important part of skepticism is to be open to the idea you might be wrong. Yeah, and I, and I have changed my mind. I've changed my mind from being a believer to being a a skeptic and i've gone back towards the middle ground as i've said and i've changed my mind on kind of individual issues within the kind of research domain and i i kind of really 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 respect people that change their minds <laughs> it's um i don't see it as a weakness um i know that there's some areas some domains in life like politics where it's kind of suicide to ever change your mind on an issue but actually i take my hats off you know to, to take my hat off to any politician that, that is kind of capable of doing that um but um yeah i mean say so, so you know what would convince me that ghosts existed it would i could probably say probably could never get direct proof but maybe th there are possibilities for indirect proof that would push me Why? in that direct yeah not even ghosts per se i suppose from my point of view i'm really trying to struggle as well as to what might falsify the ideas that I have. I sort of identify as a consciousness sort of having an experience and then how the hell do I explain that sort of a thing. I can't really get past this idea that clearly I do affect the world and I'm very fond of materialism, not as a totalizing philosophy, tying everything up into a neat little bow, but I'm very happy with the idea that well, to an extent that things are made up in matter, I think it's a very useful way of looking at the world. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, the next generation of nuclear reactors and things like that, you know? They're really interesting and the potential that's there is really incredible and I can get quite excited by the science of that. Uh, sorry, where was I going with this? <laughs> I suppose I'm curious how I might change my position but it's, it's not just about ghosts or something. It's, it's about... It's, it's about something that, if I might be so bold, might radically expand the science about how we see ourselves, and that would be amazing. I mean, it could be anything. It, it could be telepathy, precognition, ghosts maybe, but out-of-body experiences, anything at all. And I think the thing that I'm thinking in my head the things that you might find more interesting, tell me if I'm right or wrong here, is sort of like the AWARE study, where we have controlled studies getting more data via that means. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean again, yeah, that's, that, that, that study and, and similar studies, because, I mean, it, it was kind of when it was pre first presented, it was if this is the first time it's ever been done. It wasn't, actually. There have been people trying that for... For a while but not on such a, a, a grand scale um but so far nobody has actually reported one of the bloody hidden targets now if they did um again i kind of i i kind of uh, i've got this account 
in the forthcoming book, The Science of Witch, it's available in all good bookshops next year. Um, I, I was kind of... I, Have you got a cover for the book, a uh, picture for the book? I'm, I'm worried that they'll use the poo emoji. <laughs> 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 um, I don't know. That, oh, might, um, that might sell quite well. I will do. Uh, wrong audience, though, probably. True, true. Um, no, um, I, I did a, a kind of uh, yeah. The big questions on on BBC. I, I did one of those talking about all this kind of uh, stuff, and travelled back on the train with Ken Spearpoint, who's you know got who's one of the kind of names on the paper, and I can't remember obviously the conversation in detail but i definitely got the impression from ken rightly or wrongly on my part that that somebody had actually identified one of the targets and i was like oh, god wow oh now when this paper comes out i'm going to be really embarrassed you know you know um and then when the paper actually did come out no nobody had done that you know not again i maybe i just kind of misinterpreted what ken was saying to me but that was that was definitely the impression i got we had a nice friendly friendly chat you know um but yeah that that that, that kind of evidence i mean even there i mean what would happen then let you know i i haven't kind of quite liked to play the kind of the do the mind experiment them of okay so what if we do do this experiment now and we find evidence of telepathy or alternatively to my believer counterpart how will you react when we don't find evidence of telepathy you know what i think about because there's a those two possible outcomes or maybe the even more frustrating one which happens an awful lot in parapsychology of a oh well maybe it is maybe it isn't kind of result you know <laughs> <laughs> but you know um you know you've, you've got to kind of because if, if i was taking part in say you know one of these testing a psychic on tv or something like that and the results appear to suggest that this person really did have these abilities obviously i thought well how would i react you know i mean well in fact yeah, on a kind of on, in one sense at all it kind of happened i don't know <laughs> i don't know if you ever remember that wonderful wonderful tv series britain's psychic challenge it was on I channel know five of it. i never watched uh, it, it, it <laughs> the, the the only the only channel named after its number of viewers um and, uh, i i was one of the skeptical panel it was like a kind of um x factor for psychics okay and so they had a bunch i suppose you still need to explain this for anyone who hasn't seen this but have you seen have you shown a clip of this on a talk that you did in manchester at all I don't think I've got any clips from this now, actually. No. Okay. Because I've, I, 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 sorry, I've, I've seen you before at one of the talks when you came over to Manchester, you see, so. Right. Um, no, but... I, don't I don't think I've shown clips from, from oh, that yeah. programme. Oh, you know, I, I'd be quite tempted because some of them were quite interesting. But mm. there, was, there was one in particular. Oh, God. In goes the bottle. <laughs> That's not good, is it? That's not good. <laughs> Oh, getting isn't... a bit redder and a bit redder is the time. I am getting a bit redder and a bit redder, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, um, no, because um, I mean, the idea was it was like a kind of X factor for psychics and there was a series of sceptical challenges, uh, sorry, it was a series of psychic challenges every week. And now, you know, we being, um, there was myself, uh, a guy called Philip Escafee, who's a kind of conjurer and mentalist, and uh, Jackie Moulton, who's the... Um, uh, she was she was in the police force. She's the person that kind of you know, the prime suspect series was based on. Kind of female. He turned out not to be a skeptic at all. In fact, <laughs> lesser. Um, but anyway, but both me and Philip, you know, yeah, we were we were, we were proper skeptics. We were not allowed to kind of design the tests, and that's understandable because if we had designed the tests, then nobody would have passed them ever, you know. And and this is a program that's aimed at believers in the paranormal. Right. Um, right. But the, the point being that kind of every week, one of them would be eliminated until eventually you have the final and somebody is crowned as Britain's top psychic. Now, you know, should someone like me take part in this at all? Uh, a lot of skeptics would say no, because you're giving extra legitimacy to a programme that doesn't really deserve it. Um, yeah, my, my kind of attitude has always been, well, if I don't do it, somebody else will. It'll be a lot of fun. And they'll pay me. Yeah, <laughs> so, so I did it. And I, and I quite know, I knew that, you know, it was going to be edited in such a way that, you know, 
the skeptics wouldn't win. There were a couple of very impressive performances. Uh, and one, well, a, a couple, in fact, by a woman called Diane Lazarus. Uh, now, she, what she did on kind of two occasions, well, I'll just describe the one of them in the final, was locate a person who had been kind of hidden in a very, very, very wide area. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the contestants were told to use their psychic ability to locate this person. And she just immediately set off in the right direction and found him. And uh, it was impressive, you know, only three possibilities. I mean, as, that I can see. Mm. One, she has genuine psychic abilities. Two, somebody told her there was some cheating going on. I wasn't, I have no evidence that that happened, but that's obviously a possibility. Or three, it was just an extremely lucky guess. Um, but I mean, yeah, my attitude is, wow, you know, that's amazing. Uh, we, we should do this under properly controlled conditions. Her attitude, understandably, well, I shouldn't say this, but I can understand her attitude would be, I've just been crowned as Britain's best top psychic. <laughs> Why do I want to kind of, kind of risk, risk losing that, that yeah. by taking yeah. part in further tests with you, you know? Um, but, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, uh, for what it's worth, that's what happened. And I had my hands up and say, wow, that's amazing, you know? I mean, I mean, the only thing that I'd say about that is that it was, you know, it was one case. You, you'd have to, Ooh. as you say, do it multiple times to get the real statistical... Well, to be fair to her, she had already performed in a very similar way with similar levels of success in a previous test that I wasn't involved in. So, yeah, which I, and I know that the other kind of um, contestants on the day were not happy that a very similar test had been used in the final, the one that she'd already done very well in. But, you know, I mean, since, you know, since then, I've not really heard a lot of her about uh, about her being, you know, an amazing psychic detective or anything else, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if, if we could get some, something like that that could be replicated, you know, properly investigated, you could vary this, you could vary that, you could really try and get the bottom of it, that would convince me. I mean, potentially, I could be convinced that telepathy is real. I could be convinced that, you know, most of these kind of claims of paranormal abilities are real. The other side of that is... There's no way that I could ever prove that they're not real. I just may have been looking in the wrong place. I may have been yeah, testing people in the wrong way. Yeah. You can you can prove some negatives, but not this one. Right, <laughs> no. Fair enough. <laughs> but again, it's not. I mean, when people say you can't prove a negative, there are some negatives you definitely can prove. You know, I have not got a mouse on my hand now. Okay, you know, <laughs> yeah, you can prove that. But something like this, maybe we're just not looked in the right place. Maybe it's around the next corner. Uh, but so, so you end up with a decision to make about, well, on the basis of all of the available evidence as it currently stands, what do you think? Uh, and I kind of, I'm, I'm not convinced. <laughs> you guys are more inclined towards believing it probably... You know, there probably is uh, some truth in, the, in, in paranormal claims, but uh, yeah, I mean, what would what would what would convince me? What could convince me would be a reliable, replicable demonstration. I mean, there's nothing that we could use as the basis of a first year lab class based on parapsychological phenomena. Yeah, it just just it just wouldn't happen. Exist. Yeah, Matt, did you want to um, look at your flow chart? Because I think that's something we wanted to do before we finish, isn't it? Oh, yes. I should have put the file somewhere so it was easy to get to. <laughs> I, I didn't in the end. It, uh, it, it's sort of, um, it's a simple way of representing the argument that I made earlier. But, uh, I mean, I tell you what, if you guys want to just carry on the conversation while I just find the uh, graphic. And if, if I've got to look at this chart, Darren, you'll have to kind of and expand that area of the screen so yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I'll... It's, um... it's, it's, what I'll do is I'll I'll turn the spotlight off of off of you, put it onto Matt, and then um, Matt, you you should be able to share your screen. Uh, now okay. the question is, how do I do that? Uh, right, <laughs> right clicking does nothing. That's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> right, 
with that just makes matte bigger uh gallery there we go right so turn remove the spotlight from from you if you let us know matt when you're ready will do there. i suppose uh, one other thing we could we could mention is there's a lot there seems to be a lot of reluctance to accept anything that would suggest that consciousness or even mind which i equate as two different things um are perhaps non-local or non-material in nature there's some kind of speculation that that would require overhauling everything we understand about the world and everything we understand in science and i think there seems to be some reluctance to study it because of that reason but to me and i don't know if you agree but to me to suggest that consciousness is is fundamentally non-material wouldn't negate everything we understand about the brain and everything we understand about physical matter because that would still be there that would still make sense i mean all, all we really can know about the brain in relation to consciousness and mind is correlation those correlations would still be there it would to me it would be adding another level onto the science that we currently understand by adding another dimension to it what, what do you think about that no that, that that sounds plausible i mean i must i must confess that i i kind of get a little bit irritated when you know particularly kind of psychologists and parapsychologists kind of just say you know oh quantum physics <laughs> as if that that explains everything because quantum physics is weird and this stuff's weird so that must exp you know no, that you, you need to go a bit further than that to kind of establish that there is some kind of mechanism there that could really account for what you're talking about but i mean in the same way that um <clears throat> you know einsteinian physics took over from newtonian physics I mean, New Newton was doing a pretty damn good job, let's face it, you know, 99.9% oh, yeah. um, 99 .9, 99 .9 and then Einstein kind of was 99.99%, you know, so the idea that um, there could be, I mean, yeah, we, we know that there is still stuff we don't know and and it's okay to say you don't know. Uh, Plus it's and, and yeah, may, maybe it will be explicable in terms of, of of quantum physics or string theory or whatever else there is. But I mean, I'm not a physicist, and I I cannot understand that stuff. I don't pretend that I can understand that stuff. And I, I kind of just come back to you know, I mean, when you get kind of situations where people are explaining um, you know homeopathy in terms of quantum entanglement, I try and kind of bring them back to say well just we just let's look at the evidence of whether or not it works in double yeah. blind randomized clinical yeah. studies yeah. establish does it happen then ask why no, yes exactly yeah. don't try and explain it before you found out that there is something there to explain now that, you, you may well be right there is certainly you know every time people have proclaimed that you know we're, we're on the verge of explaining everything it's just a matter of dotting the i's and crossing the t's we've been proved wrong and uh, there's and, and at the moment i mean if anything you know with all the kind of you know dark matter and dark energy and all this stuff that the the astrophysicists are kind of acknowledging that we we really don't know much about this stuff mm. you know and it, it would be a bit presumptuous and something to, that makes up the majority of, of reality as it is you know dark matter it's something we yeah. don't understand but i suppose sorry matt just before we go on to yours uh just one last question i'd like to add to that and that's you mentioned about the um needing kind of a foundation to explain the mechanics of how consciousness could exist separate from the brain would it not be fair to say that defaulting back to the facts or the, the belief that the brain does create consciousness we also don't have a mechanism to explain how that can occur from fundamentally non-conscious matter Absolutely. so they're both yeah. just, see to me yeah. and this is yeah. kind of my yeah, no, this is my overall position so from the evidence that i've seen you could take that evidence both ways to say that it's evidence that the brain produces consciousness there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that exact same evidence which is correlatory can also be used to to say that um to evidence the, the possibility that there's a non-conscious or a non-conscious a non-physical form of consciousness that interacts with the physical brain and to me there's more evidence in support of the latter because we have phenomena allegedly that cannot be explained by the former and to default immediately to the first explanation that the brain produces consciousness is no more supported than it is to suggest the latter because neither have a, a reasonable mechanism to explain how that could possibly occur does that seem like a reasonable position i think, that's, I think that is reasonable and i think but i think it's also reasonable for people like me 
to see, well, how far can we take a non-paranormal explanation? Because, I mean, if nobody's trying to offer a non-paranormal explanation and putting those explanations to the test, that's really important. You know, if nobody's doing that, then there is no kind of, you know, there, there is this kind of, there's just this mysterious stuff over here that n nobody's trying to offer a kind of non-mysterious explanation for. So, you know, I will try and do my best. Um, and I, I think, you know, in, in some areas, I think the, the kind of sceptical account is more successful than others. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of worth doing, certainly. Uh, not only as an explanation for ostensibly paranormal experiences, but the, uh, some, some of the kind of lessons go beyond that. Because, I mean, another thing that you can think, that, that the way I think about anomalistic psychology is, it's very much about uh, the effects of, of kind of belief on perception, interpretation, how you make sense of the world. And the fact that I focus on paranormal beliefs, it also generalizes beyond that to political beliefs, religious beliefs, even which football team you support, you know. Um, well, yes, there you go. Yep. Now, I realise there are some unjustified leaps right at the bottom. So that's not a, that's not you know, like the emergent to atheism and fundamental okay. to theism. I, that, to... That, we don't have to worry too much about those bits. Okay, I, I could talk through them at some point, but I do particularly like the fourth conclusion, though. That made me laugh the first time. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to aim for that one now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So are you going to talk us through it? Um, I, certainly, oh, yeah. Do you want me to talk through it in the way I'd answer it, which, whichever works best for you? Well, um, I suppose, you know, I, I've thought so much about this stuff that I feel like I keep saying exactly the same thing. So I don't know, <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to step through it and just tell us where you're going, if, if you're happy doing that, I'd be, I'd be very happy with that. Right, I'll, I'll have, give it a go then, right. Start at the top. You can make this into a board game, you know. You can make a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> I might give that a try. <laughs> okay. Does it feel like something to be you? Yes. Uh, are you able to explain that to others? No. Uh, then who wants to listen? I mean, I'm, I'm saying, I mean, yeah, I was obviously being kind of slightly, but generally, no. no I mean, I, I, there's a that, point there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, who or what answers the next question? Uh, and the only way then is to go back to say, feel like something to be you. Um, oh, I mean, is, is that, okay, so is that justified? Because um, the only way that you can go back is to the question of, does it feel like something to be you? Uh, couldn't I have a bot, uh, an arrow coming out of that box saying, philosophers? Well, so, 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 neuroscientists, so, you know, I mean, how do I need to improve what I've got here? Yeah. So, how can I improve? Well, as I say, I mean, is that, I mean, is it legitimate to say, although I can't explain it, maybe people who are cleverer than me can? I don't think, as I said before, I don't think anybody's <laughs> solved the, the kind of the, it, the hard what, problem. What, what exactly? Um, I suppose. What exactly does it mean when when you say, "Are you able to explain that to others, Matt?" Right. This is a point of ambiguity. Yes, no. yes, yes, yes. No, it, it made sense to me. It's obviously been stress tested and showed some weakness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Peer review is always okay. important. I suppose the way that I would understand that question would be that. I can at least explain that it feels like something to be me to other people, and they sort of know what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, like, no, no, no. All right, so no, we just in that sense, yes, I, I, mm. I agree with you. So I suppose in that sense, I'd have gone down the yes, uh, and you'd have said the mind shapes matter. Yes, <laughs> a slightly leading question there, by the way. <laughs> the yes, <laughs> the, the option to disagree. <laughs> And I would say, no, uh, I don't think the mind does shape matter. Uh, and then I'd go back up to that same question again um, of who or what answers the next question. Um, so, I, and again, I'd come up with the same thing of, well, maybe it's not me, but maybe, maybe some um, future 
potential philosopher stroke neuroscientist will come up with the answer. Um, I mean, I, I feel like there are interesting answers in play at the moment. Um, I'm personally a bit of a fan of idealism, but like a strict sort, like, an, uh, like uh, Bernardo Castro's yeah. analytical idealism. Metaphysical I'm idealism. I'm not sure what that is, I'm sorry, I just don't... Gotcha. Not... Uh, there's a, well, uh, there's another version which is a little bit more well-known, which is panpsychism. Well, if, I just, like if, I, if I just jump in very quick and give a very, nature. give a very basic idea of idealism, it's effectively saying that um, matter is what the mind is, what consciousness looks like from the perspective of a dissociated mind. Is that right? So effectively, consciousness is, or the brain is, what consciousness looks like in a material form, similar to, is it, um, yeah. similar to how, especially, yeah. How does it relate to a kind of? What is it called identity theories? That I mean, I, yeah, what what it feels like to be on the inside of a of a system that has consciousness, if you like, for for want of a better way of phrasing it. Um, I mean, I know, as I said, like I said to you earlier on, a few yeah, you know, a few years back, I, I even wrote a paper. I even got a paper published on kind of in this kind of area that um, nobody's ever read. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I did kind of get quite into this whole kind of issue of, you know, what is consciousness and how, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure, am I, am I making this up? Was, it, was there a kind of a, a, a strand of philosophy of mind that was kind of I, like, I'm sure it's called something like identity. I think the most I can relate to that position at the moment is sort of like, how do you see your own identity as a conscious being? Do you associate with the matter, with the form that you have in terms of matter over time? Because then you've got the ship of Theseus kind of problem. If we just replaced small parts of you all the time, would you still be the same you at the end of it? I can't remember. It was, it was kind of, you know, consciousness is basically what it feels like to be on the inside mm -hmm. of... And, and again, I'm not using that in a kind of sense of, you know, physical location, but sure. in a more abstract sense. The, the inside of, of, of a system that is that is conscious. Um, identity. I thought it was called identity theory, but maybe I've got that wrong. You, or maybe things have right. <laughs> moved on in the last 20 years. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I kind of, I, I, you know, I, as I said before, I never, you know, I, I, I kind of drew some conclusions to that period in my life that um, might be interesting to throw back at you and see what you think, that... Um, the kind of um the sense of a unified a, a unity of consciousness is an illusion how does that go down guys when you say a unity of consciousness how do you mean we have a we have a sense of a a kind of of a self of an i of a me that is kind of um you know response that that, that is thought that is unified yeah, the fact that kind of different aspects of perception are um, processed by different areas of the brain, but we don't we don't have any sense of that. We feel as if you know color and movement and shape. You know, we just have a sense of the, the world around us. You know, we see a blue triangle. We don't just see a triangle and know that it's blue later on somehow. Almost the kind of. You know, again, I don't know much about Buddhism, but the kind of sense that, you know, there there is no such thing as self. Yeah. yeah it's an illusion in that sense. Sh shall I kind of describe what I see as consciousness and the distinction between consciousness and the content of consciousness? So to me, consciousness yeah. is the... <laughs> how to describe it? It, it? It's the thing in which experience takes place. It, it's the thing that experiences experience. It's kind of, you know, like... a the sky is consciousness and the clouds are the content of consciousness the self that we develop as we grow up comes out through or develops as a form of or as a result of um recycled information that we get from uh, the morality of our parents uh the idea of what gender we are what color is and what, you know all, all that sort of thing develops into a sense of self what we believe is right what believe what we believe is wrong what we believe is true what's not um how we interpret what we see which is very different amongst different cultures, for instance. But regardless of which culture you're from, which species you are, the content of consciousness will be different. But the blanket, or the, the blank screen 
of which that experience happens without any um, identification, without any representation, and without any um, without any uh, I'm missing the word Inter without any interpretation of what the senses input that blank canvas where that all takes place is consciousness everything within that is content of consciousness and is certainly very well very strongly tied to how our brains work and how our society um shapes us i take descartes uh view quite seriously in the notion that i could be deceived about what i'm experiencing there's all sorts of things that could be possible right i suppose Possibly the uh, possibly one that I'm not sure is bad or good, but maybe I haven't actually been around for nearly 40 years. Maybe this is a video game that I started playing 10 minutes ago, you know? I guess the key thing for me is that while you can have all sorts of, of... Even though I could be under a complete illusion about what I'm experiencing, it might not be what it seems. It seems to me that there is something that we have to resolve as the I that is having those experiences, illusory or, illusory or not. That's something that doesn't seem to break down into an illusion. And I understand that some people say that it is. I've tried to take the view of, say, Daniel Dennett very seriously, and I've thought about it a lot. But it doesn't seem to make any sense. My own experience of the moment always seems to be the evidence against that point it's it does sort of make sense if you want to describe the whole of the universe purely in terms of behavior purely in terms of things doing stuff which is natural from a scientific point of view but i think that when you have to factor in something else that it feels like something to be a thing at least some of the time then i think that you're in a different ball game. I think I think no, we're, I we're saying pretty much the same thing. So that everything we experience throughout our entire lifetimes could be illusionary, but the one thing that can't is the identity that is experiencing those things, because either it's experiencing or it's I, I, not. I tend to agree with you guys on this. Uh, I mean, I, I like I said before, I've not really delved deeply into this stuff for quite a long time now, um, but my kind of feeling is that um yeah i i i have had these arguments in the past you know kind of uh saying you know just just seeing those neurons light up is not the same as experience what it's like for those neurons to be lighting up and all that kind of stuff you know um and uh yeah i kind of i i kind of tend to tend to agree with you um i uh, I, I think a lot of what consciousness feels like what it's what it feels like to be conscious may well be illusory i mean when people kind of say you know ask questions like well do you believe in free will i i honestly can't see a good argument that it does really exist but it feels like it exists and if we don't have it the implications of that in terms of moral responsibility and so on are such that i wouldn't want to live in that world so you know i mean i, th I think i think it was i think david hume said this i'm like i may be kind of getting this wrong uh you know it's one thing when he's kind of writing his philosophy at his desk it's a, quite another when he gets up and engages with the real world you know and I, and i very much see it in that way and very much feel the same way about it myself that if these are just kind of useful illusions for us to live our lives by and interact with other people and so on and so forth, then then so be it. You know, there's a lot of things in my life that I may well believe in very strongly that I could not possibly justify rationally or intellectually. Uh, not least morality <laughs> morality as a whole you know there are a lot of things a lot of issues that i get very very kind of riled up about um that i you know i couldn't possibly if, if i don't if I, let's face it if free will doesn't exist then morality doesn't exist so that makes sense that makes sense yeah yeah so, so, you know, I sooner live in a world where there was such a thing as morality. I don't believe it comes out of a, a holy text. I 
kind of basically I kind of believe that some things are the right things to do because they just feel like the right things to do. Um, like treating other people like shit is not a good thing to do. Respecting other people is, is, is the right thing to do. You know, caring for other people is a good thing to do. So can't just I think, I think I, I speak from a position of someone who isn't religious in any way that if, if you, assign your morals only and primarily from a religious text which is dubious in it in its nature in many ways anyway i think your morality is not from the correct foundation i think if morality is to be an effective one and a genuine one it should be from one's experience of life and learning as we develop what's right and what's wrong and how it feels internally not how god or, or some deity tells you you should be because then you're you're being moral for the for the sake of being rewarded in the afterlife yeah. not as opposed to yeah. doing it because it's the right thing to do and you feel that inherently you know that's that's, that's my i mean it's it's a huge it's a huge debate morality and objective morality but that's that's my take on it and i, and I i'd go along 100 percent with that <laughs> absolutely so I think we did you want to add anything else about the nature of consciousness Matt uh, we kind of varied away from your uh, um, flow chart a little bit didn't we <laughs> I think the free will thing I've got a little bit of something there which is that I've realized that well my way of conceptualizing it is that this I thing this me thing is able to have some effect on the world as a mind I'm able to tell other minds that I'm a mind thing that it feels like something to me so I'm like aha well, there's, there's definitely at least one thing I can do. I can tell other people that it feels like something to be me and they can reciprocate. And so that loops back to that theme that I started out with, which is this idea that to some degree, I don't see a logical alternative to consciousness having some sort of effect on the physical world. How that comes about. How it works, I've got no idea. I'm very open-minded about it and interested to hear what other people think. It's from that basis, though, that I just find all this Psy stuff absolutely fascinating. I'm remembering what you said earlier. I know that unless something goes horribly wrong, I should be able to get lots of data for this sort of pre-sentiment experiment and there is part of me going you know what the result is that you're gonna get don't you matthew you know it's <laughs> <laughs> um, i mean i will wish you luck you man <laughs> no i mean it's um yeah I mean, I mean, I mean, none of us, none of us know, none of us know, and certainly where consciousness is concerned, none of us know. Yeah, even even those people who claim to know, they don't know, <laughs> and claim very, uh, very aggressively to know. Often so, they do. The more aggressively they someone do. affirms something, you know, the more bullshit it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do feel quite strongly about some of the. Th ideas that I've got, but I like to offer them up for rational discussion. I think that when you see something and you think, I can't see how else this could work, it becomes quite a seductive point of view. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but you don't you don't bring it forth as if it's fact. You open it to debate. No. That's the difference. <laughs> no. I, is that, I, is that, if, if I, you know, uh, being somebody who, yeah, obviously has a kind of pretty much materialistic view of the way things work, um, I can't see how free will could work. You know, I can't see how the atoms and molecules in my brain can somehow behave in a different way to the atoms and molecules in the rest of the universe. Um, on the other hand, I have a very, very strong sense that, you know, I am a self-conscious person being i can make decisions i can take actions um now whether that's illusory or not you know is it just an epiphenomenon i do not know um but i will live my life on the kind of basis that uh yeah in many respects even i mean it's a logical contradiction for me you know that 
if if I um, if I took if I took that view really seriously, then you know clearly I could not hold anybody responsible for a criminal act. They had no choice, um, and yet I don't want to live in a world where that is actually how we view things. So. Um, I mean, there's, there's um, you know, when well, you get into all kinds of you know, paradoxical situations, so it, whichever way you try to, I do anyway, <laughs> when it, however I've tried to kind of think about these issues, I always end up with something that doesn't seem to quite work and make sense. So, uh, like I said before, I've kind of, I've backed off on the big philosophical <laughs> issues and, okay, let's see if you really can send your thoughts to this person over here. That, that's easier to test. <laughs> okay. So I suppose, and um, before we end, I suppose, uh, if you don't mind, I'd just like to kind of get your opinion on a on an analogy on just one last kind of philosophical thing of how material produces consciousness it's one from bernardo castro who we mentioned earlier very good one of the best analogies i've heard is that because the brain is effectively a series of binary switches on or off action potential or no action potential at its very foundation um to assume that that somehow a huge coordinated system of, of those switches can account for a conscious experience can create a conscious experience what would what would your thoughts be on if we were to say use a different language but exactly essentially say the same thing with um taps and pressure valves and pipes yeah well, you know, yeah I, exactly. you, you, I don't need to describe the analogy but what, what would you think about yeah, yeah. that no i mean um you know when i was very much into this kind of area uh, i'm sure it's a book that you guys have probably read anyway the mind's eye i have edited actually. by uh, Oh, you know, edit oh, you really must. It's a brilliant read. Uh, it's edited by Daniel Dennett and uh, and Hofstetter. Um, and it's just a collection of kind of essays and scientific papers and blah, 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 all about the philosophy of, you know, identity and this consciousness and all this kind of... Oh, it's a brilliant book. Oh, you must get hold of a copy. Um, and, I mean, uh, and what they do is to kind of present the original publication and then make, do it, give a commentary on it, you know. And, and you know, whether you, whether you agree with Dennett or not in his wider philosophical positions, it's a very interesting read. Um, and, and kind of one of the uh, points that they make is like about how you can kind of, you can present scenarios, I mean, particularly with thought experiments. I mean, you know, I, I love thought experiments. I'm sure you guys do. Uh, you're probably familiar with John Searle's Chinese Room. Yeah, Chinese Room, yeah. Experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and kind of, if you kind of um, take something like that, which on the surface looks like a, I mean, and still to me is a strong argument, you know, don't, let, don't get me wrong. Um it, it, it can presents a very strong argument there, but then you can kind of change some of the settings on the kind of thought experiment uh, of that and kind of in other scenarios where you end up thinking about it in a kind of very different way, you know, and it's, 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 it's kind of, well, I think they, I think they use the term your intuition pump, you know, right. how, um, right. When, when you're trying to imagine these scenarios in a thought experiment, you think about them one way, but then if you think about this as not something that's happening on a very kind of human kind of sliding symbols under the door and getting symbols out on the other side, but a kind of you know, magical demon that can do this at a top speed and blah, 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 you know, and suddenly you've got something that's more brain-like, you know, and then the idea that maybe consciousness could be an emergent property and so on and so forth seems more intuitively acceptable um and I, and I think you know that that does you know that, that does apply um whether going back to your question you know well, i mean whether, whether whether it could be that you know there are kind of conscious life forms out there somewhere that are kind of you know that, that are genuinely conscious but operate at some kind of like glacial speed because of the kind of chemistry and the physics of what's happening. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it's possible. I don't know. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what consciousness well, I think the, is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think the the illustration that the, um, the analogy is supposed to offer is that 
most people would say if you have a, a huge country sized um, amalgamation of taps and pipes with water and you equate that to kind of uh, you know neurons and electricity and, and chemicals it would seem pretty foolish to say that a huge array of taps and water could become conscious even you know no matter how complicatedly you arrange it and it's kind of equating that to neurons which are also by definition you know non-conscious matter at their foundations yeah. um, you know according to functionalism if you've got something that essentially does the same operations you can't deny it's conscious you know uh, it's, I mean, I say, you know, I mean, people use kind of analogies like, you know, toilet roll tubes and pieces of string and all kinds of other stuff. But if it's essentially doing the same stuff and producing the same, I mean, particularly in the kind of context of a Chinese room type setup, if it's producing the same output, how can you deny that it's conscious? A thing that for me, part of the definition of consciousness really has to include that feeling like something to be a thing. And if I coded my computer to just pretend, I, <laughs> it wouldn't sway me. No, but, well, well, this is kind of essentially so, so and, and uh, you, you'll be pleased to know, because I did listen to uh, an interview, uh, the first bit of an interview with you, Matt, earlier tonight, and you referred to what's it like to be a bat. That's in there. That's in the collection of <laughs> the Mind's Eye. Oh, you do. You guys have got to look that up. I know it's an old book now. I mean, I read it. God, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You read it forty years ago. I'm, I'm old. Um, no, uh, it's probably not quite that. Probably about thirty years ago. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a really, really thought-provoking set of essays and commentaries. And uh, yeah, you guys would love it. Thank you. I appreciate the recommendation. I'll check that out. And can I just say that I think you've actually, up until quite recently, I was saying that a podcast interview that I, I had done recently um, with Bruce Dickinson, the front man for Iron Maiden. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's, oh, that's my life. It's so glamorous, guys. <laughs> Was, was the longest ever podcast interview I'd ever done. But I think you've We're just about it. broken his <laughs> record. <laughs> I'll yes. tell you, I, I did one with, I mentioned Gary Habermas earlier. And we were just going to talk about, you know, belief in, in Christianity and, and near-death experiences. And it was going to be maybe an hour and a half. We went on for, I think we approached four hours. Because we just started, we just started talking and just kept talking and just conversing. <laughs> 